um, and how platforms are created to actually manage those data flows and ideally create a sort of central repository for marine data uh, that can be used for licensing and consenting decisions. Uh, lots of activity going down there. Uh, this is mainly a Cornwall focused project that actually reaches out with businesses across the UK. Um, and anyone out there that's interested, um, if you're not in Cornwall already, give me a shout. We can find you a nice office somewhere. Um, also, just wanted to thank the Ocean Power Innovation Network, um, which is another project that Catapult is involved in. Um, Open is trying to create a network of interested businesses across the ocean energy sector, um, supported by six different research organisations uh, across six countries. Uh, Open is a free network to join, again, really good networking opportunities. Um, and we also offer a service called a Technology Assessment Process uh, that may be interesting to any new businesses out there that may want to talk to some of the experts involved in the project, um, get a view of your technology, um, potentially support to evolve it, demonstrate, validate it, test it, uh, whatever's required, um, and actually produces a report that's quite useful for investment. Um, again, if you've got any interest in Open, please feel free to contact me. I'm very happy to tell you more about it. Um, I've just put my contact details up there. Um, as I said, you're going to hear from a number of people from the Catapult today. Um, RAS Systems work really crosses a lot, across a lot of our activity um, and different projects and departments. Um, but anything I've just discussed or anything general with the um, conference agenda, just feel free to give me a call. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to our first presenter of the day, um, Hamish McDonald, that's going to give you a bit of introduction and background to the Catapult, some of our recent activities and exciting projects. Um, so I shall pass over to you, Hamish. That's great. Thank you, Neil. Um, I'll just get my slides up. Um, give me two seconds. Okay, um, are those coming through all right for you, for you, Neil? Yeah, all clear, thank you. Cool. All right, so um, my name is Hamish McDonald, and as Neil um, gave in his introduction, I'm an engineer based within the operational performance team. And I'm just going to give a very brief overview of what the catapult is, what we do, and uh, a, a flavor of some of the, the robotics and autonomous uh, uh, systems projects we have on the go uh, our, uh, at our facilities. So, um, for those who are not familiar with the term catapult, um, there are a number of different um, catapult um, networks, I'm um, sorry, uh, catapult centres across the UK, um, not just including ourselves. We have um, there are research areas involving high value manufacturing, um, satellite applications, and even um, medicines, medical applications. Um, and the whole uh, concept around the catapult centre is to transform these uh, early uh, research ideas into valuable commercial products and services. Uh, we are independent, not-for-profit organizations. Um, and our, most of our, uh, sorry, uh, our funding model is based uh, upon the thirds idea. So we get a third uh, of our um, funding from Innovate UK, the UK government's uh, innovation arm. Um, and that helps us keep the lights on and, and keep our facilities running. And then the remaining two thirds are provided from additional research funding um, ex externally and also from engagement with industry as well. So um, our aim as the offshore renewable energy catapult is to accelerate the creation and growth of UK companies in the offshore renewable energy sector. And we do that through some of our facilities we have based um, around the UK. Uh, each with um, specific research and engineering capabilities. Uh, we're also often thought as a conduit between um, innovators, um, SMEs, uh, and large-scale industry, uh, and also um, academia institutions um, that are uh, developing um, unique products and, and innovations in these areas. Um, our main focus is to accelerate creation um, and growth of UK companies uh, through evaluating certain products and helping um, assist their development. Um, and as we'll see later on and throughout the, the day, um, our key role is to reduce the cost of these products uh, and also to um, reduce the risk uh, in their deployment. Um, so de-risking renewable technologies is a key part of uh, our, our remit. Um, growing UK economic value, making sure that the UK supply chain has a, a significant contribution um, in, in this area and overall transitioning to a low carbon economy. 
Uh, as Neil mentioned, um, we have quite a wide UK presence. We have our um, uh, primary uh, offices based in Glasgow and Blythe, um, but we also have a, a huge range of regional centres across the UK, uh, not discounting our uh, academic research hubs that we have investigating uh, specific areas of, um, of turbine research, such as electrical infrastructure uh, in, at the University of Manchester and South Clyde, um, bleed research at the University of Bristol, and uh, the powertrain uh, as well at the University of Sheffield. We also have a small presence in China, um, looking at the, the supply chain opportunities uh, across um, across the continent. So um, our, organ um, our organization, as a, the offshore renewable energy catapult, is split into three separate directorates, each with um, uh, three um, uh, separate um, remits. Um, but we do have a lot of um, cross -coll collaboration between these directorates. Um, Firstly, we have um, our test and validation uh, directorate, and that focuses on um, uh, research and, and testing of the next generation of large scale uh, wind turbine components um, and, and balance of plant. Um, you may have seen in the news um, that we've been, uh, our, one of our most recent endeavors has been uh, testing what was uh, the, the world's largest uh, wind turbine blade, 107 meters in our large blade test facility, um, and also uh, the testing of uh, largest nacelle um, from, from GE um, as well. We also have the Operational Performance Directorate, which I'm based in, and that focuses on improving operations and maintenance practices uh, and making sure we are um, uh, running these uh, turbines as effectively as, as to possible, as well as uh, other uh, research areas in the renewable space. Uh, and then we have the Research and Disruptive Innovation um, Directorate, um, which uh, Neil uh, and a, a few of uh, colleagues here today are involved with as well. And that is looking at the latest um, disruptive technologies that can help um, uh, push new ideas and, and, and new innovations in this space. So I'll just press pause on this video for now. Um, one, of the, one of the most uh, prominent research projects that I'm involved in, um, and, and I'm just trying to take you through a, a small, um, uh, route map of, uh, of different research areas we have in this space. And this was one that was a, a very early and ambitious um, concept um, that came about through an innovation lab that was hosted by uh, Innovate UK uh, back in September 2018. Um, this was uh, quite unusual compared to uh, Innovate UK's usual funding processes in which they tried to bring together um, different uh, stakeholders and different um, institutions that wouldn't normally work together to try and um, uh, inspire new ideas and new um, um, uh, and new innovations that could potentially um, uh, be utilized in this space. So out of that work, that the innovation lab and the memory project was born. And this was, uh, this began in March, 2019 um, and had a, a very ambitious two year program trying to um, uh, Proof that fully autonomous missions can carry out inspection, maintenance, and repair tasks at offshore wind farms. So very far reaching, um, and we are uh, quite way through the project right now. Obviously, we have been affected by COVID, but there's been a, a number of um, really unique um, developments and developments in, um, uh, in individual subsystems and the overall the, the harmonious concept of different uh, robotic systems working together. Uh, or a catapult's duties in this project is to provide uh, detail on the end user requirements, how this could be um, uh, uh, utilized by uh, owner operators of, of UK wind farms, as well as providing um, uh, facilities for testing and demonstration of, of prototype systems. Um, we are just uh, one member of a large consortium um, partners working on the project, as you can see in the bottom left hand side. Um, so, this animation to hopefully provide you a, uh, a bit more flavor of what the, the concept actually is. Um, so the whole idea is to try and um, um, use completely unmanned missions to carry out blade inspection um, of wind turbine and blades. Um, so we have an ASV uh, floating out to a turbine of interest, um, scanning the, the blades while they're still moving uh, with a moving turbine blade inspection system to give a first pass of inspection. And then if it's deemed necessary, um, a drone will launch and deploy a crawling robot um, to provide further detail on 
uh, that damaged area and even uh, potentially carry out um, uh, minor um, uh, maintenance and repair duties as well. So that's at the very low end of the TRL scale. Um, moving on, we've um, we have another project which has, has seen uh, large scale development and since I've been involved at the catapult and this is the, the blade bug uh, robotic crawler. Um, so this has gone from um, initial concept to something that uh, has really uh, advanced over the number of years um, since it started. Um, ORE Catapult have been um, supporting the development of this robotic system, um, providing technical um, guidance uh, and industry knowledge that are um, paramount to making sure that this, uh, this robotic system is developed um, with the end user in mind. Um, and we've also, uh, early on in the, the funding, uh, they carried out some initial testing on some static wind turbine blade sections and as well as on the training tower to uh, verify individual um, subsystems of the robotic uh, crawler. This moved on to a second phase of funding where the, the robotics control systems were, um, uh, were, were enhanced um, and in the end this resulted in a, a, an actual representative environment testing um, at our at leaf and mouth turbine based in, in Fife um, in November last year. We've, as well as uh, supporting development of, of new ideas and new technologies, um, we also um, uh, assist in the uh, demonstration of um, certain technologies that are on the cusp of commerciality um, or haven't, uh, are trying to um, break into uh, the, the market. Um, one such example um, is uh, the demonstration of the IX Blue uh, Drix uh, autonomous surface vessel um, uh, down in Blythe, where uh, we exhibited the technology um, and uh, remote operations from shore to a variety of different industry stakeholders. Um, and the AS3 traveled from uh, the port of Blythe um, to the nearby Eon turbines and carried out um, uh, so some survey tasks um, all from, from shore, uh, sorry, all, all controlled from shore, um, which was uh, an exciting uh, uh, demonstration, um, not to say the least. And um, I'm also involved in a collaboration with Vattenfall and their Aberdeen Bay wind farm, uh, where we see uh, such technologies um, that are on the curse of commerciality and, uh, and they are vetted um, uh, by ourselves in Vattenfall. And, and if we feel they have particular value, we um, test them in, in a more commercial space. Um, there are a variety of different robotic and uh, demonstration um, projects we have in the pipeline um, and, and all different domains uh, of the wind farm. So um, aerial um, vehicles, subsea uh, and surface vessels as well. Uh, unfortunately, we have been affected by uh, COVID um, recently. And unfortunately, uh, site uh, operations are limited to essential ma maintenance only, but we're hopeful once uh, these uh, restrictions ease, um, we should see some exciting uh, demonstrations uh, take place. So that was just a whistle stop tour of some of the projects um, we have on the go. And I'll hand back to Neil now. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Hamish. Um, so hopefully you can see there is a lot of support we can offer, whether you're at the very early sort of concept design stage, um, interested in conditions around wind farms or control systems, uh, whether you're looking at demonstration and validation or hoping to move towards the commercial wind farm opportunities. Uh, there's a lot we can do to help. Um, Again, lots of these projects also listed on the Catapult website or the Periscope report I referred to earlier uh, also has quite a good project list there. Um, so just get in touch if you want to learn more. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Lewis Stevenson. So Lewis has recently joined us um, with an ocean engineering and naval architecture background. Uh, Lewis is particularly involved in the floating wind ski um, projects. But today he's going to give you a bit more information about potential use cases um, at technology intervention areas. Um, so over to you, Lewis. Thanks, Neil. And I'll just put this into presenter mode. Is that all good from your side? Yeah, looking good. Uh, so good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. As Neil said, my name is Lewis and I'm a graduate engineer with ORI Catapult. I have been with the Catapult for just under six months and I'm a naval architect within the floating wind team. The majority of work I've been a part of so far has been in relation to offshore floating substructures. 
And today I will be highlighting some of the use cases for robotic and autonomous systems in the offshore energy sector, which I'll more than likely refer to as RES from now on. So to give a quick overview of the agenda I'll be following, I'll be starting by giving a quick description on the predicted growth of the energy industry, followed by some of the challenges experienced before then looking more into some of the operation and maintenance factors, which from now on I'll refer to as O&M and the improvements needed in this area. Then finally, I'll give some details on the transition and what technology we currently have available before then finishing off by giving some examples of the potential RAS for both above sea and subsea opportunities. So to start with, I have just some statistics showing the increase in wave and tidal energy forecasted to 2030, with tidal being predicted in the range of 1,324 megawatts to 2,388 megawatts, and wave energy being predicted to be in the range of 178 to 494 megawatts. The graph below shows the average size of turbine rating from 1995 to the predicted size at 2025, with the size of the circle showing the average number of turbines each year. Uh, this data is the turbines included are either fully operational under construction or the consent has already been authorised. Uh, as the overall deployment of offshore wind continues to increase, we will be pushed further from shore. Uh, this has led to floating offshore wind making significant advances as we look to harness these deeper environments. However, as we move further from shore, uh, we will encounter harsher environments along with some of the other challenges which we already face being amplified. Uh, this slide is just to highlight some of the different challenges related to the installation and o and of the offshore energy sector. As you can see from the examples given, there is a wide range of different challenges involved, which could be as simple as some connectivity issues, or one of the more serious challenges relating to the structural integrity of both the offshore wind turbine substructure and the crew transfer of vessel. Uh, one area of importance which I will emphasize is the operation and maintenance, as this is an area which could be improved across the industry with the utilization of robotic and autonomous systems. Uh, moving on to the factors involved in o &M. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see the basic split of the different downtime factors of o &M, which all build up to make things a very time consuming and costly thing. I've also included a quick example on the right, uh, which is a scenario showing how costly a power outage co can be caused by just a fault in a single cable, as it can amount to up to 5.4 million pounds per month. And it can sometimes take several months to essentially get this fully fixed and operational again. Uh, this is probably one of the worst case scenarios, but it is still worth highlighting how important it is to carry out inspections to find any potential faults before they can amount to anything serious. Uh, the cost isn't the only negative effect related to O&M. Uh, asset downtime is also a considerable problem when you take into account all of the potential delays involved in carrying out the maintenance. Possibly the most important factor, as always, is the health and safety risks involved in carrying out the inspections. As, for example, the current way to inspect the blades of an offshore wind turbine is still using personnel connected to a rope and abseiling down. There is also a buildup of emissions produced by the variety of vessels required for the different turbine designs and substructures, which for a re renewable energy wind farm, you can probably guess isn't the best combination. So why make the transition? From the points I've mentioned previously and the fact it can typically cost around 75 million a year for a one gigawatt wind farm to conduct the required o &M. If you then also remember the expected growth of the energy sector, Combining these with the challenges I have displayed in the second slide, which would all be amplified the further we get from shore, it is clear that the current O&M procedures we use will not be sustainable in the future. However, this transition I'm speaking about uh, would not be from the start, as we already are utilising some robotic and autonomous systems we have available today. These are shown here with the remote operated vehicle used for subsea inspections or the unmanned airborne vehicle used for blade inspections, which in most cases would normally be a drone. So what use cases do we have in the future which would benefit the offshore energy sector? Uh, first, I'll be describing some examples of the above sea opportunities. 
the first being drone inspections, which are currently already used to gather data on the surface of the blade. But the next step is to have drones which can capture a larger range of data, for example, the subsurface condition of the blade as well. Next is the drone payload transportation, which would be which would allow the movement of equipment such as tools. However, this of course would be restricted to lightweight payloads. For technology at a, a marine surface level, uh, the first example is a unmanned hydrographic survey vessel, where its aim would be to ascertain the topography of the seabed or detect any into array or export cable exposures. Uh, this type of vessel is already at the prototype stage. Uh, these kinds of survey vessels can also be adapted in the future to potentially gather other types of data, uh, such as marine life. And another type of another idea at marine surface level is a vessel payload transportation, which would be mostly most likely remote controlled at first, but there would be the aim of making it completely autonomous, uh, like with many of the other designs. This is similar to the drone payload transportation, except this would have the capabilities for much heavier payloads, such as materials or heavy equipment. And finally, the last type of above sea opportunities is contact robotics, which can be characterized as blade crawling. This type of system, which is which essentially crawls along the blade carrying out inspections, but the hope for the future would be that this kind of inspection robotics could also be adapted and further improved to carry out minor maintenance problems as well. An example of this kind of technology would be Bladebug, which my colleague Hamish mentioned previously, which the Catapult is currently directly involved in. Now for the subsea opportunities, following on from the other contact designs is the foundation crawler. This type of robotics would be attached to the foundation of the system and would carry out inspections looking at the structural integrity, especially with regards to things like corrosion. Another similar potential technology would be a mooring line or cable crawler. This would involve a robotic or hopefully in the far future an autonomous subsea vehicle which would operate along the cables or mooring lines detecting any potential faults or excessive marine growth buildup. This kind of autonomous vehicle in the future would also allow the frequency of inspections conducted to be increased, improving the quantity of data available on the mooring lines and cables. This additional data could then be beneficial to the machine learning side aspect in order to better predict why and when these failings might occur. Uh, finally, the last piece of potential, uh, potential technology I'll discuss is the idea of docking stations. This type of, this type of technology would likely be an additional, uh, in addition to some of the previously mentioned robotics. Docking stations could, be, could completely eliminate the need for a vessel and a crew to travel to a site uh, as these robotics could be controlled either from the shore or if you want to take it that step further then they could be completely autonomous and the data would either be stored at the wind turbine or sent back to shore. Overall this would mean technicians would only need to travel to site for definite required work but more importantly it would be preemptive work. And to sum things up I mentioned some of the robotic systems currently in use such as the remotely operated subsea vehicles and the unmanned airborne vehicle, which in most cases are called drones. Uh, these compared to some of the ideas I just mentioned, uh, show we are still near the beginning uh, stage of the transition to a robotic and autonomous energy sector. But it is important to take note of the amount of opportunities available and the different areas we are yet to explore in both subsea and above sea. So it's important not to limit ourselves and remember that the industry is only going to grow larger, meaning an increase in both opportunities and more importantly, the demand for the robotic and autonomous systems to be a bigger part of the offshore energy sector. Uh, thank you for listening and I'll pass you back to Neil now. Yeah, great, thanks for this. Um, as I said, some of those key use cases <clears throat> we'll be picking up in the workshop sessions um, after the coffee break. So that gives us an opportunity to provide some more information there a um, bit more elaboration on some of the projects um, and certainly we very much welcome your, your interest and your comments at that point. Um, one thing I just wanted to pick up before we move into the next presentation, um, as I said we're doing lots of deep dive activity in this area through Periscope um, and as we looked more at the sector we can see lots of the use cases clearly, uh, there's a lot of demonstration validation work happening um, but one of the thought, things we thought could be really beneficial to the sector um, is start to try and substantiate the cost and carbon benefits a bit more clearly. Um, so it can feed into business development opportunities and help companies raise investment. 
Um, so Anthony now is going to give us a bit of background on some work he's recently completed to effectively build the carbon case for vessels. Um, so we have a comparison we can use when we then look at RAS solutions. Um, so I'll hand over to Anthony now. Um, that's going to give you a bit more of a briefing on that work. Thanks, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. Is that coming out okay now? Yep, got you. Yeah, so good. Good morning. And for th and th any Gray is my name, and um, my role at Ivory Catapult is is as a techno economic. Uh, analyst, which pri primarily involves me su supporting the business case of SMEs who come to C Catapult with a particular I innovation. And prime Primarily, that's been involving identifying what impact their innovation could have on the levelized cost of energy of an offshore wind farm for for example, but we're, we're beginning to see those potential benefits being s s squeezed a bit now big, big because of how much the, the cost of offshore wind has come down over recent years. So come companies and project de developers are be beginning to want to find find other areas where th these innovations can benefit so this this piece piece of work i've done and it's published on the Uri catapult website now was re re really all about just identifying what what the typical Im 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 emissions are that get produced from O and M vessels at them. A moment, big, because that in, in, in information can then go into these business cases for for, for these in these innovations, and put, particularly with aut aut autonomous vessels, but it could cover any innovation that will reduce the, the average that, that will reduce the average time that Essels us ending at a wind farm. And so this, this, this area is also big, becoming a, a, a topic of interest with the likes of the 
climate change conference com coming up and sev several countries have had these targets for re 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 reaching zero emissions. So the I, I won't really go into a massive amount of detail about the, the paper here because it is a, a published on the Catapult website now, but um, just, just to really some, summarize it, it, it was, was all about some bottom up modeling for the EO and M act activities that uh, and the tip typically on off off offshore sh 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 or wind farms, then the, that 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 bottom up to day. That bottom up day data was then a tested to 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 make it as realists as I could. And so the, the scenarios I ran were a smaller wind farm that was a representing the types of wind farms that um, the, that that were built around 2010 kind of time. And um, the, the strategy for O&M was focused on a ETV. The, the other scenario I ran was representing some, some of the big, bigger projects that are going to be built around 2020 or 25 and the the O&M strategy there was the assumed to to be based around an SOV so some of the 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 assumptions and the the sources of data they are listed it on here and the the the, the, the results of the
her work, her reduced some, some numbers for the the annual emissions that come come out of these two two different types of vessels, but the best way I found really of presenting these results is a uh, uh, gigawatt hour generated by the wind farm. So I, 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 will, I won't really um, cover any or cover any of the specific numbers um, because it's all in the, the a paper on the Catapult website, but um, that, that, that sh 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 I'd give that, 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 that should, should be giving an, that, that should, should be giving some, some, some idea of that in, 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 in emissions benchmark so so that we he can be begin to as 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 so that we can begin to as as these innovations on the carbon case so so that um of covers that neil yeah that's great thank you actually um as i said the, the intention here was to try and build a carbon and cost case for ras obviously the, the first critical step there um was to understand the competition effectively uh, and the emission case for vessels so those two things can be compared um, and that really leads us nicely into the next presentation um, where you get an explanation of some of the work we've been doing through a system called Compass um, that effectively has been developed at the Catapult to enable us to identify very specific offshore wind o &M tasks, um, match them with the standard sort of state of delivery in terms of vessel use, um, and then model it against alternative, al uh, alternative RAS systems um, to allow us to validate that cost carbon benefit aspect. Um, so you're now going to hear a bit more from Hamish uh, and Anthony um, on the compass modelling and some of the preliminary results. Um, again, I will just add quickly, we're expecting to have a report out on the compass modelling work uh, at the end of March. So again, feel free to keep in touch um, if you want to see some of those results as they're produced. I'll now hand over to uh, Hamish and Anthony. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Neil. Um, so, um, I'm going to give a brief introduction um, about uh, the objective of this project um, and also the Compass tool itself before uh, Anthony goes on to, to discuss some preliminary findings um, as well. So um, yeah, as uh, Neil has mentioned um, a couple of times before, um, the aim of the Periscope project is aiming at establishing a permanent innovation ecosystem in the North Sea region. And here in this, this a project we're, we're hoping to build not just um, a case in terms of quantitative evidence for cost, but also uh, in terms of health and safety risk and carbon emissions where um, robotics and autonomous systems can improve over uh, traditional um, O&M practices. Um, the scope of, of this project um, did focus um, on floating wind and wave energy, um, but there, there will be potential to um, look f into other areas. Um, with the tool uh, uh, outside of this, this project. Um, 
we focused in on uh, for floating wind assets on um, wind turbine blade inspections uh, and the, the potential for minor repairs on these blades, um, and, but also for subsea inspection maintenance activities um, for both floating wind and uh, wave devices as well. And we're hoping that the, the figures and the, the, the metrics that come out of, of, of this project will help stimulate new research areas that will help um, uh, prove that there's a case for uh, developing autonomous solutions for uh, the marine uh, renewable energy sector overall. Um, just give you a, a brief kind of uh, impression of um, where things stand in terms of the, the anticipated trajectories of insulation for both floating wind and wave energy. Um, I clearly see that there's a, a contrasting ambition for both. Um, we can see on, on the, the top right hand side the, the expected growth rate um, from um, an ORI catapult um, report for um, floating wind. Um, across a, a number of different uh, areas across the globe. Um, and we can see it really going to the, the high gigawatts um, beyond uh, 2030. Um, the UK government itself has uh, recently set a target of one gigawatt to, to be delivered by 2030. So that'll be uh, significantly advancing upon the, the few prototype uh, wind farms we have available in, in the UK currently. Um, for wave energy, um, I've, I've picked out um, a growth scenario here from an ocean energy report um, delivered last year. Um, and we're looking at more like half a gigawatt by 2030 in a, a high growth scenario, so a really ambitious scenario that involve um, several factors that are stated in the table in the bottom right hand corner. Um, both uh, depend on, on, on co-location co um, and, and the ambition for actual commercial uh, large uh, utility scale wave farms as well. Um, but it's, there's some commonality between the two different technologies that neither has yet to converge to a singular design, um, although there may be some uh, more common ones we've seen uh, in the prototype designs. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, but I think it's important to note um, that all. Uh, if, uh, if these ambitions are, are to be achieved or at, at a, a, a suitable um, level of cost, um, they shouldn't try to emulate what is currently being um, uh, undertaken at fixed bottom offshore wind farms. Uh, and we should be looking ahead um, to try and improve upon these practices and make uh, these cost reductions, health and safety risk reductions, and, and the carbon case as well, um, become more of a reality um, down this route map. So I'm just going to describe uh, the COMPASS tool itself. Um, and at the Catapult, we, we love an acronym um, and this one's no different. Uh, so COMPASS, the COMPASS tool stands for Combined Operations and Maintenance, People, Assets, Systems and Simulation. Um, we have, when you're dealing with the renewable energy sector, a lot of acronyms and but when you include robotics in that, there's a lot more as well. So apologies today for, um, for the barrage of acronyms you've received so far. Um, the tool has two um, variants, a deterministic mode, um, which uh, includes um, data and assumptions uh, 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 on uh, failure rates, on uh, maintenance rates and, and capacity factors, um, as well as vessel usage before um, outputting um, the kind of metrics I was uh, noted on previously. Uh, and there's also a time, time domain mode, um, which is described in the right hand uh, flow diagram where it will um, make decisions on, uh, on personnel, vessel usage, uh, and the suitable weather windows um, for carrying out to m activities. Um, the model itself um, is based upon the bottom-up principle, so individual activities on, on uh, specific wind turbine subsystems. Um, and these are described um, through a variety of different input parameters, whether these are um, uh, planned activities, unplanned, or a combination of both, um, the rate at which they're carried out, um, uh, the frequency uh, as, uh, as well, um, as, and the, the actual downtime of, the, uh, of an asset or subsystem associated with it, as well as a degree of urgency um, that the activity should take place. Um, there are a variety of different technicians and, and, and personnel that are involved in individual uh, tasks, not just uh, specific technicians. Um, uh, common technicians, so um, we, we have, um, we have a, some granularity there, as well as the different craft required um, 
uh, SOVs, CTVs, and, and otherwise. Um, risk is also accounted for in both um, consequence and, prob uh, and probability. Um, and the cost uh, is accounted for both in uh, the labor uh, cost, the, the craft cost, as well as the consumables and uh, individual equipment that are uh, uh, counted for when carrying out individual O&M activities. Um, just going to give a brief overview of some of the data source, the sources that we utilized um, for the purposes of uh, Compass, at, and particularly for this project. Um, so the 4C offshore wind farm service vessels database was used to, um, to corroborate the, the substance of the, the vessel specifications we had, including such um, uh, parameters as average speed, personnel capacity, uh, and so on. Uh, as well as um, com uh, confirming what particular uh, vessels were utilized at uh, individual uh, wind farms uh, for the different baseline wind farms we have uh, and the scenarios and environmental conditions um, that they can operate in. Um, the failure rates for the components, particularly for the deterministic mode, um, were um, built up from a uh, combination of publicly available sources, um, academic sources, uh, and uh, the Sparta um, uh, endeavor that we have at the Catapult as well. Um, further research provided assumptions for um, uh, new technological components associated with floating offshore wind, such as mooring lines, dynamic cables, and, and substructures. And the wave energy inputs primarily came from uh, Wave Energy Scotland. Uh, for the time domain mo um, mode of the, the Compass tool, um, whether time series data was extracted from the current uh, project uh, for these purposes. So the baseline um, a floating offshore wind farm, um, we, we hypothetically um, uh, generated uh, for the purposes of this project, uh, was located just off uh, the northeast coast of Scotland in the uh, NE8 uh, boundary area, as you can see uh, in the top right hand uh, map. Uh, it does have a specific lay layout, um, but it, as for the purposes of the model, it, it does not mean that the layout um, uh, imparts anything on the environmental conditions or the wakes um, that are um, uh, that are involved in this layout are, are not con considered um, when evaluating uh, these O&M activities. Um, there are two um, uh, uh, ports uh, close by to this, or, or closest to this uh, uh, hypothetical wind farm, but Peterhead was chosen um, uh, due to its assembly and manufacturing capacity. And due to the, the distance from shore, um, we uh, uh, decided on a SOV or an M strategy for this uh, for this wind farm. For the wave energy case, um, the hypothetical wave farm um, was based upon the Palamis wave uh, power uh, wave energy converter um, that was tested um, between uh, 2008 and 2014. So one of the more, more notable um, uh, devices uh, in in this in the sector. Um, and the, when the, the device was undergoing testing at EMEC up in Orkney, um, the Linus uh, O&M port in uh, Orkney was utilized. So we went with that same assumption there. Uh, and dissimilar to uh, the floating offshore wind case, uh, this wave engine crater uh, was uh, assumed to have a total shore O&M strategy. So these were the reference activities that we down selected um, general subsea inspections, including surveys, um, cables, and both um, ex export and, and array, and also in in including the dynamic uh, cables that are associated with floating offshore wind platforms, uh, the mooring systems as well, um, and uh, the turbine blades um, uh, were included there. And so uh, a combination of different uh, uh, robotic uh, vehicles were utilized for this. And for all of these cases, we're uh, assuming un completely unmanned, uh, fully integrated operations. So uh, for a blade uh, inspections, similar to the memory concept, this would be deployed from an ASV, for example. Okay, I'll now pass you on to uh, Anthony, who will describe some of the initial um, results we've, we have generated uh, after this. Thank you, Pat Hamish. So the the initial results coming out of this work are pre presented here, but um, the re 
report that will it'll be published at the end of March, I think. They'll they'll be either full res, re, results in here. One thing to to point out is that the time time domain mode of compass up operates with a m, 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 Monte Carlo sim, s, simulation, which it basically means that there won't ever be two sim simulations that can come out the, the exact s, 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 same really. So we have had to put on some on fit in 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 levels on all of the results there. Did the the results presented here are the the normalized ones. So it's basically a gig. it tells us what the percent impact is. And so the example here is that the the, the fourth, fourth, fourth or the wave energy scenarios by by implementing the Rob, robotics here, the a vessel and 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 the the a vessel and the personnel costs both come down. Good. Could you move on? Oh. Will you say much? Thanks. Then the the carbon case here, that's really all about the the existing vessels. Some some of them will will be rib. Some of them will be rip, rip, laced by this zero carbon ASBs. So the example here again. Shows, shows, shows that that change is having a really pos positive impact in terms of re reducing the emissions that the the O and M. Essels are pro producing. Could you move on again, please, Hamish? Thanks. And then, and then the final area that we've con con s s s s s is it is 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 
his his, his faith. Is they health and a safety risk? So this is really all about moving the person now who would. It's really all about re re removing those persons and L who would normally be spending a significant amount of time off off or and and undergoing these particularly high potential risk. So, so OM tasks and 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 in in head moving moving all of those jobs over to the safety of the onshore O. Oh, of the onshore O&M base. Could, could you move on, please, Hamish? Thanks. So, nearly to um, summarize, this, 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 this kind of modeling is really bad. Hey, based on assumptions, so, so the, the, the best way, the best way to refine all of those assumptions is by and testing these innovations and 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 carrying carrying on getting these de 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 devices out in the the water as well so, so as i mentioned the full open access report of this work should be should be published the end of April and um, the end of March, rather, begin, beginning of April kind of time. That's right. Elliot? Yeah, that's, that's... Thank you very much. No, that was great, Anthony. I said it's really nice to um, see some quantified results there, and I'm sure it would be interesting to a number of the businesses on the call today. Um, again, just, just to give you a bit of an idea where the compass modelling is going, um, as I said, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll be very ready to work with companies that may come forward with their own technology or new solution. Uh, obviously, compass gives us an opportunity to help you model the specific tasks your technology could complete. Um, and again, build up that cost benefit case uh, to help your investment plans. Um, so just very quickly, um, Going to give you an overview of the workshops um, that we'll be running into next. Um, I'll go quick because we're just cutting into the coffee break. Um, but effectively, we'll have four workshops running um, from 10 past 10. So we'll stick to that time schedule at the moment. Um, Matthew Hadden, now Deputy Delivery Director at the Catapult, will be running a session on validation. Uh, Dan Summer is one of our project development managers with specialism in robotics and autonomy. Just for a second, I was trying to work out. Um, they'll pick up the residency workshop um, before we move on to offshore wind consenting technologies with Alex Loudon um, and a look at smart logistics with Daniel Allington. Um, just to mention, please do feel free to drop in comments, questions. Um, very happy to try and bring you into the conversation if it's possible. 
Uh, but if you can do that with comments rather than putting your hands up, because there's um, a few too many people on the call for me to map that. Um, so please do feel free to feed in. Um, otherwise, you're going to be listening to me quite a lot over the next hour. Um, so we'll leave it there for now um, and see you all again at, at 10 past 10. We'll now get started with the second session um, and our breakout workshops. Um, again, just to mention, please uh, put any chats in, uh, comments into the chat. Um, and I'd now like to pass over to Matthew Haddon, um, the Deputy Director of Delivery at the Catapult, um, who's going to lead the discussion on validation. <laughs> okay, sorry for that misstep. Right. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Neil. I've got a few uh, slides here just to try and um, um, create a bit of debate and discussion around uh, how we should be testing robotic systems. Um, feels like every time we talk to somebody, we get a slightly different uh, point of view and opinion. So uh, it's a good topic for some discussion, I think. Um, so to start off with, we were hoping to run a quick poll. Um, I'm hoping you might be able to see some questions popping up on the screen. Um, so there's two questions here. Firstly, uh, we would like to understand uh, why you think the main purpose of undertaking RAS technology testing is. And secondly, is it clear to you what the process is for gaining approval to use RAS technology in the renewable energy sector? Okay, so that can go on in the background and we can come back to the results at the end of the presentation. So to start off with, I uh, just wanted to highlight some of the challenges and the questions that uh, we have when we're using um, RAS technology. Uh, so the first, the first challenge is basically, is the technology uh, going to be able to do the task as well as uh, human interfaces? Um, obviously, we're doing uh, many tasks at the minute using uh, human personnel. Um, so we've got to make sure that the robotic technology can do things uh, at least to a minimum standard, but ideally better than the current standard. Uh, second challenge is, can these technologies work in offshore environments, very harsh environments? Uh, it's no good if it works in a, in a laboratory, but you take it offshore and it falls to pieces. Um, does it make economic sense? So it might be able to survive the conditions and do the job, but if it's 10 times more expensive, it's not going to work out. Uh, do we trust and have confidence in these systems? Um, at the end of the day, owner operators might be taking decisions that have millions of pounds worth of liabilities. There could be HSE impl implications, environmental implications. Do we trust the robotic technology to uh, base those decisions upon or perform, perform certain high risk tasks? And finally, and I guess this is the, the key question in my mind is, is how do we demonstrate that this technology can actually meet these challenges? Um, and can, can testing basically be the tool to, to provide that answer? So just very quickly, um, just to explain how the catapult uh, approaches this problem. Uh, this is our site in the top right hand corner. Don't know if you can uh, see. Uh, we've got a blade test facility and drivetrain test facilities, but our robotic testing uh, is really focused in and around this area here, which is our dry docks. We've got three uh, dry dock facilities. We're right on the River Blythe, so we can also access the river uh, for testing. And down here is uh, off the coast of Blythe. We've we've also got um, a dem uh, sorry a, a met mast. Uh, that we own and operate, and there is also five offshore turbines owned and operated by EDF. Um, so we've got this offshore capability as well. The way we approach it is we try and cater for all technology uh, development levels and all technology groups. And I think you will have seen from the conversation already this morning is that there's an enormous uh, range of technology out there um, so it's quite challenging to tailor the testing process to each one of those technologies because every application, every technology needs a different approach. Um, 
the facilities are managed and ran as flexibly as possible to try and accommodate that variation. And I guess the service we're trying to offer is a robust and independent validation of performance. Um, so it's really clear that we know what we know and we know what we don't know. But that's just the start of it, really. There's almost too much choice on how you go through this process. So I've just thrown together some, some comments here of some of the dilemmas that we, we all have when we're trying to de-risk technology. Uh, robotic systems are inherently complicated um, and there's many, many, many ways of going about this. So the first question is, uh, do we want to use empir empirical or theoretical uh, methodologies? There's one school of thought that says, I'll only believe what I can see. And there's a sort of more modern uh, school of thought that, that says, well, let's simulate a model uh, what's happening. There's no need to actually do full scale testing. Um, then once you get into the testing, there's a question about, well, do, do you need a playground environment where you can have the freedom to do whatever you want and play and tinker and um, kind of have that experimental um, setup? Um, or do you need the, the strong rigor of repeatable methods and standards and everyone goes through exactly the same process? You then have the conflict of, do you want to do this testing in a laboratory uh, where it's simulated conditions very controlled environments or do you want to be out in the in the real world in offshore environments where you have a much more um, unpredictable and variable uh, set of testing conditions um, and then finally is it a test or is it a demonstration so are you testing uh, whether a product can meet its design specification um, or are you uh, simply validating that it can perform a task that it's intended to do? So there's a, there's a whole network there of choices and options uh, that need to be navigated. Um, I think just to try and distill that down into a bit of a conclusion and recommendation, there's three, um, three pillars as, as we see it. There's a low TRL pillar that's focused around empirical research. This area needs as much flexibility as possible. And it's really around, um, I guess, empowering the research and development process to allow the design, build, testing, observation, evaluation, and then improvement cycle, that feedback loop to continue until a design is settled and uh, developed enough to perform the function it's designed to do. Once it's got through that sort of rapid change uh, R&D cycle, it's then a much more uh, controlled process that is, is normally required. And at this point, you might be testing for other reasons. It might be more to do with uh, accreditation parties, clients, funders, um, et cetera. And it's more around creating that traceable evidence uh, to build confidence in the technology, uh, de-risk the technology for uh, the end users and, and stakeholders. And there you need a bit more of a, uh, a structured approach where it's clear the testing is uh, defining the requirements of the technology, uh, defining how the test should be performed, what the acceptable criteria or performance criteria of the technology is, performing the test, evaluate the results, and then a traceable report that can really demonstrate uh, what we do know and what we don't know. And then the final pillar is really around uh, I guess demonstrating that what we've done in a test environment applies to the real world as well uh, and making sure that any of the parameters that may not have been simulated accurately um, you know can be overcome and demonstrating performance in operational environments is absolutely essential to get that final level of confidence and it might test other things that are really hard to simulate in test environments so things like um, how people uh, may operate technology or how uh, interfaces with the um, the assets uh, may come about some of those things are only um, can only really be evaluated in the real world so it's really important that we go through each one of these steps um, and then just some summary remarks that really uh, testing is an excellent way of de-risking technology and as a result, good testing methods 
should accelerate route to market for new technology uh, providers. It shouldn't be seen as a barrier. Um, testing complex robotic and autonomous systems requires a really flexible approach. Uh, every technology and every application needs its, its, its own um, uh, way of being evaluated. And it has to remain proportional to the risks. So if we get overzealous with testing methodologies, then it will become a barrier. Uh, it has to be proportional to the risks of operation. Um, and uh, fi finally, testing should be a tool to uh, maximize fleet performance. So uh, it's a way of uh, basically instilling continuous improvement in operations. And with that, I'll hand you back to Neil for some, some uh, discussion sessions. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. That's really interesting. Um, hopefully those in the audience out there can pick out, we're very flexible at the Catapult, and so these, these test facilities are being developed to serve uh, your sector and your industry. Um, so if you do have particular testing requirements or needs that we maybe haven't addressed, um, if you have ideas, opinions on how they could be treated, again, please do let us know. Um, we've just had one question come through the chat at the moment, which um, I was quite interested in myself as well, actually. In, in terms of the regulatory approval framework, um, how does the separation sit between the UK and Ireland and, and potentially transferring that over to Europe? Are we looking at separate regulations per country? Um, or is there some consistency across those um, regulatory approval frameworks? And I don't know, we had a question in from um, Aidan Thorne uh, with an interesting project with the Marine Autonomous Regulation Lab. Um, I don't know, you're very welcome to jump in, Aidan, if um, you wanted to make any comment there. Apologies, yeah, it wasn't really a question, just a, a response to the, the previous question that the, 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 uh, the MCA uh, were funded under Regulators Pioneer Fund uh, through Innovate UK uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, that project concluded last year. Um, but there are, there are there, in the report there, there's a number of recommendations and things for the future of that, that lab, um, uh, tying in with the MCA's Marine, Marine Futures Technology Team and uh, taking a few recommendations forward. So I think they're, they're looking to kind of learn from the experience of the civil um, uh, aviation uh, area and um, work with a number of industry partners to really try and uh, sort of flesh out the detail around this now. Okay, yeah, great. They didn't drop the um, link there into the chat for anyone that's more interested in that project. I don't know if you got a comment, maybe, Matthew, in, um, in terms of how you get that re regulatory approval. Is it country by country? Or is there some sort of joined up approach across Europe? So um, I, th I think this is quite a difficult question to answer and I'm, I'm possibly not the most qualified person to answer it, but, but my understanding it is country by country uh, and it's also technology by technology. Um, there may be some alignment in certain areas, but I think from a UK perspective, it's, it's all UK focused. Okay, yeah. Okay, I don't know, has anyone else got any comments they want to come in with? Questions, queries? No, nope, that's fine. <laughs> I'll keep talking, unfortunately, otherwise. Oh, no, wait, we've got one. Um, so a quick question from Alex um, about designing a test programme for a totally disrupted technology. Um, I guess you could talk in the context of what the catapult would do to treat that type of approach. Yes, yeah, sure. So... Um... The, um, the way we'd start from scratch is, eff is effectively um, you evaluate the performance criteria for that technology. So you want to understand the operational performance characteristics of the technology. You want to look at the uh, potential failure modes that technology might have. You want to have a look at the environment that it'll be used in. Um, and then uh, you, you basically need to define a test criteria to evaluate each of those factors to make sure that it, it can do what it says on the side of the tin, in essence. Um, so you need to validate that it can uh, perf operationally perform what it's functionally designed to do, but it can also survive the environment it's intended to work in and be operated in the way it's intended to be operated in. Um, 
and and that needs to be done in a risk based manner. So you might do something like a failure mode effects analysis to drive out what the key causes of failure of a technology would be, uh, and that would drive your interest into where testing would need to be applied to evaluate the performance. Okay. Yeah, and again, feel free to contact us at the Catapult to find out more about that. So we have a whole team of people on hand there. Uh, so right the way through from the engineering skills to looking at the control systems, we have a number of trained drone operators as well. Um, so please get in touch. Um, so we've just got a few minutes left. So um, Vicky, do you mind popping up the poll results? Um, so just, just to give the people a bit of an idea where we're going with this. Um, one of the options we're looking at in terms of the next stages of the Periscope project uh, to potentially look at areas where we can collaborate on uh, new applications for European funding. Um, so some of the information you're feeding back here is really useful to help us identify those key areas of interest. Um, so if you want to comment on the, the poll results there, Matthew. Yeah, it's... it's uh... what you expected. It's really interesting. So the winner was de-risking technology for the main purpose of undertaking uh, RAS testing at 53%. Second was market approval at 32%. And third was design feedback at 11 I suspect there might be some, um, uh, it might be related to the demographic of the audience, uh, depending on whether it's R&D focused or operational focused or, or um, maybe it's more sales focused. Um, but I think de-risking technology is probably um, uh, the, the the classic reason for testing. Whether you know across all three of those pillars that I talked about, uh, they all have a de-risking uh, element involved. Um, the um, second poll um, is interesting as well. So that's looking at uh, did do we understand the clear process of gaining approval for Rust technology? No, was forty eight percent. Uh, Thirty-three percent could take a guess, and yes was three percent. So I think that's that's quite, uh, uh, I guess, um, interesting. That it's obviously not clear. There's only three percent of the audience, which is possibly only a couple of people, um, really understand how to qualify things. And I think that's a real challenge for the industry that we've we've collectively got to work out. I mean, basically, it's being done through a risk-based model at the moment, which is fine. But the challenge is that every operator and every end user will be applying a slightly different method to, you know, evaluating and addressing those risks. Mm. So it's very confusing for suppliers as to what they need to do to to, to satisfy that. Yeah, and I don't know. I've been talking to a couple of UAV companies lately that have just opened up the drone corridor to the Isles of Scilly. I think as, as some of those sort of testing programs accelerate, that pathway will hopefully become slightly clearer. Um, the same, we're all working closely with the regulatory authorities as well to try and map that out. Yeah. Um, certainly support you where we can. Um, just have one more question pop in. Right, so um, I just had a couple of questions in, but I'm going to save those actually for the next two sessions because um, it relates very closely to the residency and the logistics workshops. Um, so Alex and Carrera will uh, come back to you shortly. Um, so thank you for that, Matthew. Um, thank you. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dan Summer, who's our project development manager at the Catapult uh, with a specialism in autonomy and robotics. Um, and Dan's going to give you a bit of background on some of the activity around resident systems um, and the opportunities and benefits they could offer. Yeah, uh, so thanks. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Neil. I am going to try my best to share the screen as well. We couldn't see any emails, Matthew. It was okay. Okay, how's that? Can everyone see that okay? I can't see any uh, hands or anything. Don't I'm just you. Uh, can you still see me? Oh. Okay. Thanks, Dan, you made me feel much better. Well, that's no use. Screen one, share screen. Well, let's go direct for the PowerPoint, try that. Any better? Yeah, if you just see the presenter view, it should be there. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So robotics and autonomous systems, I'm going to look more specifically at offshore residency options. Um, 
I'm Dan Sumner, Project Development Manager for Ori Catapult. The aim of these workshops is to try and get a bit of a discussion going, so please do chip in. These things are no good if it's just me talking at a screen. Um, and we are looking for interesting technology services, people with good ideas, so, so get in touch. So late 2018 or so, before uh, any real net zero targets had been agreed to by most utilities, any giants or, or nations, BP came out with a goal to reach 100% subsea inspection by marine autonomous systems by 2025. Now, recent RAND4 news aside, that was based very much around an oil and gas market. But within renewables, the growing mass of turbines presents a significant operation and maintenance challenge, and residency could be an interesting solution to that. Now, a global pandemic restricting travel has accelerated some of that innovation, and we're definitely seeing more drivers for innovation, uh, automation, uh, and remote operations. Um, remote operations, including residency, uh, we're now seen as a commercial reality, more than just a research roadmap. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the state of the art, uh, as well as enabling technology and challenges. Um, Neil, uh, any of the already capital guys, I can't see any hands. If they do pop up or interesting questions pop up, please just interrupt me if that's okay. So a little bit of background on why. I know this was covered earlier, but I, I think it's important. The LCOE, LCOE has been decreasing faster than originally anticipated for wind, and it's a brilliant success story. We're seeing larger turbines, we're seeing larger overall farm capacity. We're seeing experience-based optimization. So we're growing, we're learning with every project that goes into the water, and we're seeing technology developments alongside that. However, that brings with it some real, real challenges. That reduced levelized cost of energy is fantastic, but it brings with it challenges for the industry as we follow that optimized route. So lost production becomes much more significant as turbines get larger. So if now one turbine goes down, that's a bigger percentage of overall production value than if the turbine was smaller. So keeping those running for longer is going to become more and more important. And while that's happening, OPEX margins are continuing to be squeezed almost in a race to the bottom type event. So we're going to have to do more for a more important thing with potentially less. While all that's happening, the size, accessibility, and the overall environment is becoming more challenging. And by that, I mean we're working further away from shore, working in larger significant wave heights. We're seeing high average wind speeds, increased depths, more variable sediments, and increasing assets from industries. But what does that mean, and why does that relate to residency in, in any real way? So. Challenges if we're moving further away from shore, how does that impact your OEM strategy? Does, does it change? Um, does it, if, at what point does it make it financial sense to have a residency based option? Um, potentially, or could it be alongside with an SOV based strategy? What does that mean for connectivity and communications for any robotics service if you're working further away from shore? If you're working in increased water depths, what impact does that have? If, for example, floating wind becomes the dominant substructure in the coming in the coming years, then what sort of niches are residency-based systems going to need to require to be done? You know, are we talking about cleaning? Are we talking about moving chain inspection? What what are the pros and cons of different types of substructures and different water depths? Um, and we're operating in a harsh environment. What does that mean for operational windows for residency-based systems? Um, do we need to change our traditional launch and recovery based systems for ROVs? Do we need to ruggedize any sort of topside residency based system? And what sort of advantage would that give over traditional systems? And another one, an interesting one, is interacting with other infrastructure, potentially working alongside and closer to oil and gas infrastructure. What, do, what does that mean in terms of coordination and, and SIMOPS? There's, there's been talk recently of a shared, almost Uber-based uh, residency-based system. So could you have joint assets between different owners and then applied to in different areas at different times? So a, a little bit of a look at the state of the art at the moment, or it, it's not quite at the moment, it's just around the corner. So traditional AUVs have needed so far to be followed by mothership of some sort or another to improve communication links, uh, swap out batteries, that kind of thing. They've been seen as force multipliers rather than traditional tools for doing the job on their own. 
now we're seeing the next generation of AVVs coming out with no need for mothership. So what does that mean? It means lower emissions. It means remotely controlled people staying on shore, potentially lower cost, maybe not. But what does that mean for gathering data? And what does that mean for residency? What does this mean for consenting as well, or long-term environmental monitoring and inspection? Previously, these have only been available in military operations uh, and now being looked at in the commercial world quite heavily as well. Um, AEVs have some pretty obvious advantages over vessel and RV-based operations. Uh, one being that they can navigate close to the seabed underwater, so they're well suited to those more deeper water operations. Another option is, is for subsea residency is RV or underwater intervention drones, as some people call them. These are currently creeping forward in the oil and gas domain, currently deploying uh, RV with batteries and communication buoy, for example, uh, Oceaneering's EROV system. These are enabling campaigns without vessels, so in a similar way to the AEVs we just mentioned, lower emissions, potentially lower cost, we, we don't know. Um, Another notable interest is Saipem's Hydron R, set to be deployed at Equinor's Nord field. I think it was meant to be 2021. Um, and again, that's a system that looks to spend up to 12 months underwater without being, back, being brought back to the surface. Uh, its work class cousin, Hydron W, is going through testing this year. Um, and the Elum, which is a really great looking snake looking like robot, set to be trialed at Asgard, also in the Norwegian sector. Probably closest to market is Oceaneering's Freedom Freedom Vehicle, um, likely for pipeline inspection and operations in, in oil and gas. Um, again, according to Oceaneering's website, yearly CO2 emissions of a remotely controlled operate, sorry, of a, an ROV vessel is about 25,500 metric tons. So if you were to drop off one of those early EROVs on the temporary mission, that cuts it down to 3,500 metric tons but then using a freedom vehicle will cut it to about 500 metric tons. So you're seeing emissions reduce as you see more residency, more, more levels of autonomy. And it'd be interesting to see how these develop in a residency space if, if they do. Another option is USVs. So in 2021, this year, USVs deploying RVs and EVs is, is now a commercial reality, um, entering the market, including like the first of this 21 meter and 36 meter vessels on the screen um, being built by Ocean Infinity and the Figure Seek It joint venture as well, both of which increasing the scope of what can be done remotely. Worth having a chat to Ori Catapult if you want to know about some of the earlier proof of concepts. The Seek It Figure demonstration will be coming to Aberdeen Bay shortly. Another option, or less, less talked about, is topside residency. Um, leading edge erosion is a real significant problem in offshore wind. Um, and again, if this is your area of interest, get in touch with Hamish, who was talking earlier, that's, that's really his, his real research area of interest. This image here is from a company called First Airborne. Um, they're developing a residency based UAV service controlled completely remotely anywhere in the world, where one drone looks after multiple turbines. This itself is an offshore at the moment. This is a, a, an onshore development test site, already pretty high TRL stuff. It will be coming to our demonstration turbine leaving mouth this year, looking to ruggedize it and move into the offshore market. So again, one drone looking after multiple turbines, looking at inspection, but also environmental monitoring and power performance. And, and turbine residency is another thing. We've been working quite closely with the Bladebug team that, that was mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's been a bit of a success story. And the next phase of the project focuses around more granular things that they're just getting on the blade and walking. We're looking at NDT inspection. We're looking at lightning protection checks. We're doing pretty in-depth verification validation work on how does this compare to technology at the moment? Is it slower? Is it quicker? Is it cheaper? Is it more effective? What are the pros and cons? And then we take it from there. We're also looking at things like leading edge erosion repair and identifying bolt tension requirements. Um, on tower boats to start with at least. All of this requires quite a lot of enabling technology. Um, 4G and 5G gets mentioned a lot. Uh, and actually 
several characteristics of offshore wind make utilities that own and operate offshore wind farms really good candidates for early adoption of 5G technology. Um, construction takes place in the absence of fixed communications with the mainland, often in adverse weather conditions, bringing with it significant challenges. Um, and then that same infrastructure can apply to smart ports and, and other users of that service as well. So there's, there's a lot of movement in that area. Another uh, interest area is low orbit satellites. We work pretty closely with a satellite catapult as well, our sister catapult. So it's a little bit out of my domain knowledge, but people like SpaceX and competitors like, like Amazon aiming to send hundreds or even tens of thousands of small satellites into orbit. So these mega constellations of, of flying flying routers, draping the entire planet invisible blanket of broadband connectivity, as they call it. So potential future options for robotic residency anywhere in the world. And as, as a question mentioned earlier, there's multiple projects right now based around charging and subsea charging and vessel-based charging as well. A few of them at the moment looking at wave power technology along with battery storage. And there's some other people looking at really interesting projects around power direct from the turbine to vessels. There's going to be some real challenges around standardization as we go forward. We've seen Equinor strongly pushing towards subsidy charging standardization. Um, like I was, I was saying a, a little bit earlier, it would be interesting to see that Uber AUV concept being developed a little bit further, especially in renewables where, where cost margins are, are so tight. Could this be shared assets? Um, an on-demand robotics subsidy service, for example, maybe even based on like, who knows? Um, and cost is the other big one. And, and I would recommend having a word with, with Hamish and, and Anthony who were talking earlier about the compass cost model. That's something that we value highly at the capital and I would like to see developed into further projects as we go on to say, here's the baseline for how much things cost at the moment with the existing technology. Here's your technology and how it could potentially impact the cost of, of operations. Right, I am gonna stop sharing and go into questions if that's all right. Yeah, great. Thank you, Dan. So we've got a couple of questions coming in. So we've got um, sort of five minutes just to uh, fire through those. Um, again, anything we don't cover in the meeting, we'll um, be sure to come back to you on. Uh, but just an initial question from Alex Watley at Plymouth. Um, just in relation to UAV, USV uh, developers and whether they're at the stage of looking at strategies for offshore operation in the field. Is that something being led by the technology developers? Is that a requirement that's um, being driven by the commercial wind farm developers? Is there much activity in that area at the moment? If it, we could just add to that as well, Neil. Sorry, mm, uh, Dan. Um, this is a, a, a sort of specific request. Um, so I work with Neil on the Marine Eye project down here in Cornwall, the Isles of City. We've got a company that uh, we're supporting developing wireless power transfer. He's, he's really interested to know um, whether that's a, an application or offshore wind, and in particular, um, because it's working in, in VHF magnetics, it's, it's an order of magnitude higher than current induction technology. So, um, my thought was that offshore wind is a, and offshore robotics is a, is a good place for this, but I'd be keen to know whether other people think that's kind of simple. Let's let's have a chat. I'll find it, is John's answer. Um, there are developments in, in that area. Um, so yeah, let's let's have a chat and we'll have a look at what's what kind of the state of the art is and what different people are developing, um, and see where see where that sits. Brilliant. Yeah, Thanks. that was. I, I was sort of wondering as well, Dan. I guess there is, is every technology developer looking at their own charging system, or is anyone looking at a system that could serve multiple technologies? Let's throw it wide as the group. But my impression is that is it the Blue Logic system that the Equinor. Um, helped define a standard with uh, last year, early last year, um, doesn't, that they're effectively saying we would like this standard, this three pin plug effectively to go forward. Um, it doesn't have to be, but it, it would make sense. Yeah, it sounds like the EV conversation all over again, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, great. Um, we also had a question in from Modus, uh, from Nigel. Yes, uh, apologies. Apologies, I didn't mention it, Nigel. Um, I, I realized that progression, work has progressed from there. Um, and I, I nodded to it a little bit with the, the work with the wave power device currently being done. Um, I, I didn't I didn't want to look like I was a little bit out of date because I know you're taking that work and, and progressed brilliant with it. So I, that, that's, that's the only reason I didn't mention it. 
did you want to give us a quick quick one one minute update nigel yeah can you hear me okay yeah great stuff yeah so obviously we did the uh, avision project um a couple of years ago now so we did the um, demonstration in the Blythe dry dock where we demonstrated subsea data transfer and subsea charging and then we took it offshore to the Quinty Moore offshore wind farm we did some uh, some work off there doing some cable burial survey with the system so this is a commercially ready um, AEV hovering AEV it's actually the most advanced in the market at the moment it's based on the Saab Sabertooth system and um, so we're currently off around the world doing various projects um, pipeline service cable surveys we even did the uh, the Quinty Moore um, depth of burial survey of the entire interarray uh, last year um, and obviously yeah we, we're pretty up to speed with all the different types of subsea charging and, and data transfer technology and we're, we're currently working with um, the guys at Motion on that wave riding buoy which I think you referenced there but um, yeah I think it's certainly worth mentioning you know we did a lot of good work with Catapult on that on that uh, A-Vision campaign and we completed it uh, last year and I think there's a lot of studies done on, on the, the cost benefits of using AEV uh, technology in offshore wind farms, particularly ones which are further offshore. Um, and of course, you do also made a mention of the, uh, the benefits of working these systems from SAVs as well, which I think um, can offer massive savings. And just the question, that, so that residency system you're being developed, is that only for one specific UAV technology? Or is that yeah, something so, so we, we don't want to talk to you about? Yeah, so for our system, we developed one for our system, of course, but also, uh, as you mentioned, the Equinor, uh, kind of standard uh, system is also we, we've we've been working with Saab and, and others on, on on using looking at the test facilities there. So uh, a Saab vehicle has been used on the Equinor standard dock, um, and and there's more trials planned this year. Let's uh, again. Uh, I sound like a broken record. Let's let's have a chat, Nigel. It'd be interesting to get your take on what Matthew was talking about earlier as well, uh, in terms of if we're going to be developing this offshore test site. What kind of things would, would a company like Modus potentially be interested in, in, in seeing there? Yeah, I think uh, anything like that would be good to talk about that a bit further for sure. I think uh, from our perspective, you know, having a, 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 a good access is always useful. Um, I mean, we've tried to get access in, in some of the wind farms offshore blinds before and not being able to get access to do some quick testing. So anything like that is very, very helpful. Yeah, and again, just to, to open that comment out to the audience, really, that, that's certainly something that Catapult are engaged in at the moment, um, looking at requirements for an offshore testing site for RAS systems. Um, again, if anyone wants to feed into us particular needs requirements, um, or indeed confirm that that's needed, uh, that would be really beneficial. Um, again, could help us shape up some future projects and funding calls. Yeah. I, think, I think the key message from our side is actually this technology isn't that far away from being you ready it's really having the the operators wanting to to implement it the technology exists you know over over the horizon control uh, the subsea charging the subsea data transfer all those kind of things exist the aevs already work uh, you know the hovering systems now actually get close and personal to put to structures take different uh, uh, payloads of, of survey equipment but really the, the missing link at the moment is is certainly in the offshore wind farm sector is, is finding operators who want to actually go ahead and, and, and trial and use this system. In the oil and gas side of things, Equinor are leading the way and BP are obviously doing stuff as well. So that's 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 kind of progressing. But in the offshore wind farm sector, we've not, not seen a lot of traction. I, I agree. I absolutely agree. I don't my gut feeling is this isn't a technology issue. It's a it's a market issue. And I think that's why the, the compass work is so so important. And and actually hopefully with the recent developments in round four, we might see a bit of a bit of a change there. Uh, with a bit of a shake-up happening in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, and I think just to bring that back to a question that, um, so I, I'm reading it Korea, but apologies if that's a completely incorrect pronunciation. Um, just in terms of the impact of some of these technologies, and as she said, I think that's what we're really trying to substantiate now. Um, I think we've all got a good indication these are likely to be more cost-effective, safer, um, and less carbon-intensive, but really we need to prove that case. And again, the, the Compass modelling system uh, provides an opportunity to potentially do that. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to um, finish that workshop there um, and we're going to jump into the next one now um, with Alex Loudon is the Innovation Manager at the Catapult. Um, I'm down in the southwest. Alex is much further north um, and Alex is going to have a little bit of a discussion here around uh, the advantages of using RAS for consenting 
um, potentially areas and advantages they can provide. So we'll um, jump over to you, Alex. Thanks very, very much, Neil. Can you just confirm that that's coming through okay? Yeah, got it. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, as Neil said, I'm an innovation manager at RE Catapult. My role is mostly around uh, working with SMEs and, and small businesses to help them develop their um, technology offering within offshore renewables. And today we're going to talk a little bit about consenting technologies in the context of uh, robotics and autonomous systems. Um, so yeah, I guess we're going to start off with a, a little poll. Um, so grateful if you can respond to that, hopefully it should be popping up uh, very soon for you. But I want to know which aspect of offshore wind consenting has the greatest potential in terms of the use of robotics and autonomous systems. Uh, so if you could uh, indicate your preferred answer and then we'll come back to the results in a, in a few slides time. Okay, so I guess um, the, the clue was in the poll question, uh, but what, what's involved in offshore wind consenting? Um, and so there are several different aspects uh, which must be uh, undertaken when you're developing a wind farm and, and getting it consented. Um, so I, I guess the overall process is that you're awarded the option for a lease on an area of seabed, and then it's up to uh, the offshore wind farm developer to uh, secure a consent to allow them to then go on and build that wind farm. So there are a number of different uh, activities which must be undertaken. So starting at the top, um, one of the key considerations, as with any kind of new infrastructure, is what kind of impact will it have on the natural environment. Um, and so uh, the environmental impact assessment process is, is quite complex, but essentially they have to file a scoping report um, indicating what aspects of environmental impacts they're going to explore and the methodologies that they're going to use to measure those impacts. Um, that's then approved or tweaked, they go away and um, carry out that assessment. Uh, and I guess the hope is that they show that the benefits, the environmental benefits of building a wind farm override, overwhelmingly um, override any negative impacts that there'll be on the natural environment. Um, and parallel to this, there's also uh, a, a series of statutory consultations which wind farm developers have to undertake. So this involves speaking to um, uh, authorities which are um, they're required to speak to uh, under statutory guidelines. So in Scotland, this might be people like Marine Scotland, and in England and Wales, it could be um, the Marine Management Organisation uh, or the Hydrographic Office and people like this. Um, another group that's important to engage with is, is communities. Um, I won't touch on this very long because it's probably not hugely relevant uh, to this discussion. Um, but moving on to environmental surveys, this is a really key feeder for a number of the other activities which happen. Um, so this is understanding what the environment looks like, and it might be um, look, doing things like counting the number of uh, bird or whale species present on a site through to um, kind of carrying out more site characteristic uh, activities and that's linked quite closely with the next two as well um, so obviously when you're building a wind farm you want to be really confident in understanding the amount of uh, uh, the amount of winds that there is on the site because that drives how much revenue you can create um, and also understanding the met ocean conditions so Dan mentioned in his presentation about how we're moving into sites further offshore they might have higher significant wave heights um, and this has a dramatic impact on the structures um, which need designing. So higher significant wave heights means that the foundations need to be capable of withstanding greater loadings. Um, then uh, kind of moving another bubble around the circle, there's uh, a whole suite of geophysical, geotechnical and hydrographic surveys. Um, and this is effectively understanding what the seabed is like what, uh, what kind of uh, material makes up seabed? Is it quite a clay sand? Is it a more rocky site? Um, and this feeds into things like where the cables might be buried, 
uh, what kind of foundations might be appropriate, uh, are there any kind of constraints, um, you know, are there any areas that you can't have a, a foundation, uh, and, and also importantly, is there any unexploded ordnance on the site, uh, which is a, a common uh, occurrence around UK waters. And then lastly, um, all of these surveys and activities lead into what does the site actually look like, uh, how many turbines will there be, how will they be laid out, uh, where will the uh, cables run, this is all kind of captured in site engineering. Um, and so, you know, there's quite a lot of activities there, so how much does it cost? Well, taking it all in the round, um, the total bill for all these activities comes to something in the region of £120 million pounds for a one gigawatt wind farm, um, which I guess when you're thinking about these as, as several billion pounds capex investments, it's not that much money. However, it's important to remember that this um, is money that's effectively uh, paid at risk because until they've got consent, there's no guarantee that they can build the wind farm. Uh, clearly, developers will do as much as they can to ensure they're as confident as possible uh, that they'll be able to build the wind farm, but it's, it's not a guarantee. So uh, this, this money is spent at risk. Um, and so I guess the other important consideration is, is who's involved in, uh, in these activities. So it's led by the developer. Um, they are in charge of contracting with, with various uh, suppliers. Uh, but they will be the ones that define the requirements and lead the activities. Um, but there's, yeah, certainly a mixture of uh, very, very large consultancies who, who do a lot of this activity, like sort of uh, Arif and Atkins or DHV Hasconing. Um, and then there's more specialist consultants as well, you know, maybe people who are very specialist at uh, wind resource assessment and things like that. Um, there's various equipment providers for Met Ocean uh, surveys, the, some of the wind measurement activities. Uh, and obviously offshore surveyors and, and vessel providers. So there's a whole suite of uh, stakeholders to bear in mind if you're interested in playing in this space. It's not necessarily all about the development, I think is an important message. Um, and so where could robotics feature? Well, I, I think there are a few areas where robotics probably can't feature. Um, I think it's unlikely that we're going to have community engagements led by a, a, a little talking robot. So, um, then we can probably safely ignore those. Um, uh, and likewise, I think it's unlikely that robotics will feature in, in any of these activities. However, um, in these activities, I think that there's definitely a huge opportunity for uh, robotics and autonomous systems. Um, so for example, with environmental surveys, we've done some work in the past with a, uh, an SME called Digital, who were developing a drone payload which could detect marine mammals. Um, so this could be very useful for identifying whether uh, whether there are um, this particular species on the site which need to be accounted for during installation operations. Um, on the resource and meta ocean assessment side, Dan uh, had a picture of First Airborne and their resident drone system. Um, I think one of the functions that that drone can provide is uh, wind measurements. So it's unlikely to be resident at this stage because there's no assets for it to be resident on. However, the technologies are quite transferable and could be deployed here. Um, and I, I guess probably one of the main areas uh, for me is, is these geophysical, geotechnical and hydrographic surveys. Um, you know, uh, Nigel from Modus was alluding to, to the activities they've done with us in this space. Um, and I think some of the AUV technologies um, and, and indeed unmanned surface vessels are really well suited uh, to carrying out these activities because um, they're unmanned. You can uh, set them away uh, on their mission. They can gather all this data without having the, the kind of marginal cost of having it to pay the salaries of, of people sat on board the vessel. So it's a uh, an efficient way of conducting that data gathering exercise. Um, but I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. So can we have the poll results up and see whether you agree? Here we go. So 
Uh, okay, so yes, you agreed that statutory consultations and community engagements are unlikely to be uh, undertaken by robotics. Um, and it is indeed the, the kind of geotech surveys which came out on top uh, and environmental surveys a fairly close second. Uh, lots of you felt that environmental impact assessments uh, could be impacted by robotics. That's interesting, I guess. Um, they could be in the sense that the environmental surveys which feed into them uh, could be carried out by robotics, but I, I suppose the, the act of pulling together a, an environmental impact assessment is much more of a, a desk-based activity. Um, having said that, some of the automated data processing on robotics could be very, very beneficial there. Um, so we're not ruling out. And so I guess to open it up to the floor, um, I'm keen to get your thoughts on, on these kind of three main questions. Um, and these are somewhat cross-cutting questions, which um, it cuts across into, uh, for example, Matthew's presentation on validation. Um, but the first one is what robotics and autonomous systems technologies could be deployed to support these consenting activities? Uh, what would the benefits to the sector be if these technologies were adopted? And I guess that, uh, that touches on the work that uh, Hamish and uh, Anthony are doing with the Compass tool. And then lastly, what are the barriers to the adoption of these technologies? So this could be uh, uh, testing and de-risking uh, or, or some of the market challenges, which uh, Dan has touched on as well. So um, yeah, open, I'll open it out to the floor and invite Neil back to, to moderate the Q&A. Yeah, great, thank you, Alex. And, um, as I said, please do uh, drop any comments in there. Um, we've just got one in at the moment um, that I will invite. Uh, so it's Birchall. I don't know your first name, unfortunately. It's, it's Roger. Um, it's Roger Birchall. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> Welcome, Roger. Um, so yeah, Roger, just picking up a question there, I guess, about regulatory acceptance for use of these technologies. Um, do you just want to elaborate on your question a little bit, Roger? Yeah, essentially. So I'm extremely familiar with the use of geophysics for, for AIA assessments. So I used side scans and embeds backscatter. Um, a recent issue that we got round was, was the requirement for an MMO on a USV. So th those two things do not align. Um, so we had a, the Marine, Marine Mammal Observer, sorry, um, on board the support vessel <clears throat> that went out with it on its initial trip to site. Um, but I, I, I see it as a, as a hindrance to the whole effectiveness of, of USVs because essentially USV has its much lower environmental impact assessment uh, impact, of course. But I, I do understand that, that the frequencies that it's particularly the sub bottom profilers work, work at um, is the, the critical bit for many marine mammals. So, so in our particular case, it was particularly seals. Um, as we move offshore, I suppose it becomes more cetaceans as well. Um, so is, is there is a requirement for the MMO to kind of review its approach or, or, or is that going to happen? You, I did hear you, you were fading in and out, but I did hear you mention that there, there is capability within these USVs in some of them to, um, to listen out before they start up. So that, I'd be interested in knowing about that, to be honest. Yeah, apologies if my audio was uh, fading in and out there. So, um, so I, I guess I, I was actually wondering whether your question was in relation to the kind of piling operations, but it sounds like it's very much in terms of the effect that the sensor payloads have on the marine mammals. Yeah. Um, and my honest answer is I, I don't know enough about the MMO regulations to be able to answer it properly, but the um, I, I, I guess my strong feeling is that if we can, uh, as an industry, show a technological solution to, to that issue, um, then it, it uh, will cease to become such a large problem. For example, um, you know, the drones that I mentioned that, that can uh, use the, like the infrared sensors to detect marine mammals in the water. Um, so um, there's a number of projects, the memory project, which, which Hamish discussed earlier, for example, looking at how drones can be incorporated with USVs. So if you had a, a drone and USV combo going out with the drone fulfilling that uh, marine mammal as a role, 
perhaps that would be a kind of technological solution to to the challenge. Uh, I think so. But um, does somebody at the MMO need to start looking at this uh, so so we can advance it? Because um, often I find that when we deal with the MMO, it tends to be on a almost a project by project basis sometimes the decisions made. Neil, you've had some contact with the MMO, haven't you? Yeah, we've, we've had quite a few chats, but I, I can see a few issues here. So initially we've got the problem of substantiating any effect on marine mammals from noise anyway, which is still is sort of part of an ongoing discussion, I think. Yeah. So, certainly I don't think we've been measuring um, emissions from sensors within the test facilities. But I would imagine that's something we could relatively easily incorporate, um, whether it's through one of the dry docks or whether it's testing on the offshore wind farm. Um, we could potentially build in hydrophones to part of that testing regime. But but I think you're you're probably a bit further ahead than some of the industry here. Um, most of my conversations with the MMO about the initial licensing and licensing of areas, um, as opposed to the use of technologies there. But I think that'd be a, a really good question for us to follow up on, certainly. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see an answer to that because it um, did strike me as a little counterintuitive that we were using something more environmentally friendly and <laughs> we still had to send a boat out with it. Yeah, completely defeats the object. <laughs> just suggesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, one, one thing just to mention we do have coming up. Um, so down in the southwest, we've just, we just picked up six and a half million pounds last week and we have another big bid in with um, the Strength in Places Fund. So potentially come April, we're looking at about 75 million to investing floating wind development in the Celtic Sea. Um, a large part of that activity is gonna be looking at pre-consenting work. Um, maybe a slightly different approach because the governance structure is essentially made up of public bodies. So we don't have a commercial interest in this. It's all about accelerating the sector. And, and I think we're gonna get quite a lot more engagement there from some of the regulatory bodies because we're not asking them to make decisions on a specific project. We're asking to help us lay out the regulatory requirements for developing the sector. Um, and I think that that's certainly somewhere uh, we would be pitching these types of questions. Um, yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in finding out more about that because it is, you know, I, I see USVs and ASVs advancing over traditional survey vessels. Um, and mm. so I'd, I'd be interested to understand uh, some of the regulatory um, issues. I know, I know. We've looked at the MCA over here in the UK, but we also have the MCA, Irish equivalent. You still need a support vessel to go out with your man survey vessel, whatever. And it's like, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd, I'd still certainly, my perspective, but I'd, I'd like to see the regulatory authorities actually pushing the data requirements a bit more clearly um, rather than developers going in and proposing what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It still seems to be a little bit messy and could certainly be tidied up and streamlined. Yeah, I know that people I work for are particularly interested in some of those Irish um, waters. All right, thank you. Yeah, we'll keep in touch on that. Um, so quick, Dan, I think you've got your hand up quick. Yeah, uh, quick one. There's, there's currently a project underway through the Innovation Hub, which is a part of, of the CAP, all looking at underwater noise. Um, and so at the current state of DEFRA, I think MMO are all end users in that, and this has been brought up. So yeah, end of this financial year, maybe a month after, there might be some follow on either work or recommendations. So yeah, it's being looked at, but no answers, I'm afraid. It's not, it's not a great result, but it's being looked at. It's the usual area, isn't it? No one wants to come up with an answer because they can't uh, then fight you when it gets to the decision-making process. Okay, great. That was so lots of activity going there, more to come. Um, so we'll now jump on to the final workshop session um, presented by Daniel Allington, who's one of our research development managers. Um, and it's going to be talking more about smart logistics. Um, so over to you, Daniel. Thanks, Neil. As Neil said, I'm business side of the business for Catapult. I'm just going to pull up my presentation, but speak at the same time.
Um, Neil, can you still hear me? I've got things clear. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, it says it starts. Oh, there we are. Yeah, if you just drop it onto presenter mode, should be good to go. So I just had bad, got bad connections, so if I drop out, I do apologise. Um, but yeah, so um, smart logistics for renewables. You'll tell by some of, this, some of the slides and more about some of the things going on than others, but I'll, I'll try and do my best. Um, just a, a small poll. be interesting to see what people think about um, both these questions. Uh, so question one is, do you think that the major developments of EUVs and UVs would greatly benefit the offshore market? And question two, whose responsibility is it to drive the developments in smart logistics? I want to show you what I think I'll vote myself. And we'll come back to that in a little while. Right, and so um, just a quick overview. Um, there is obvious benefits of improving logistics and making operations smart. Um, they, can, they can stem from saving costs, um, ultimately reducing the, the risk by removing human error and speed up operations. There's no need to send as many people offshore, thus making it a safer working environment. We can send smart um, vehicles out there. Um, there is some issues that a lot of companies are working at, at the moment, and that's things around the line of sight and operability. If you can't see what's going on there, if you can't get real time feedback, then it, it, it's quite hard to guarantee that's, that, that's all going to go well. And we are working with a couple of companies at the moment who have, um, I know Dan, some of, some of that touched on it earlier on about some, um, about putting some more satellites up there, but some other options with tethered balloons. Um, these have been used in other sectors quite a bit, but they can transmit the, the 5G signal to, to the site. So that's, that's something that, that we're looking at as well. Um, what, 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 so the catapult, we are in, involved with some, some projects that are out of this world. Um, one that I'm thinking of is we're speaking to a company at the moment who are developing a um, self-drive farm for the moon, if you can believe it. And they're using AI type technology um, and automated vehicles to see how we can farm and, and do things up there. I would have thought that we probably would have started with offshore wind and then moved up to the moon, but they want to jump, make that jump. That's that's entirely up themselves. Um, subsea air or topside transport. Um, I'm thinking here for getting parts to to site getting uh, people to the side, getting, getting things where they're needed. Is it better to use air? Air is obviously quicker. You can drop it at height and it's already there. Then obviously you've got some issues if there's, if there's any power loss, it drops up the sky, there's, there's other aerial um, issues with, with um, if there's too many things flying around. Obviously there's, there's a corridor now, as Neil, specified, but do we have to create this kind of corridor for all wind farms then? Um, yeah. And then whose responsibility? So whose responsibility is to drive these, these smart operations? Is it SME's job to um, think of the clever ideas and push it forwards? Um, is it the owner operator saying, right, strike prices this now, we really need to reduce the time, reduce the cost of this operation. We need people to, to come forward. Is it the catapult's job to, to look at the industry as a whole and then start pushing it and, and asking the questions? Um, but interest mode, what everyone else thinks about that later on. Um, so yes, yeah, so the potential to optimize logistics and parts transfer. Um, for the first point, I'm thinking installation vessels um, I know that uh, this might be applicable to all you, but like OHT, um, yeah, I know it's just announced one, and Demi Offshore are uh, 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 nearly finished their Orion. Um, very, very large, very, very expensive insulation vessels. Um, 
they typically carry out the, the monopiles on the vessel, um, sail the site, the, the, the fixing, fixing to the to the sea bottom, and then they move to the next next site. Obviously, with these turbines getting further out, is it really cost effective to have your insulation vessel, the very expensive vessel, going back and forth to pick these up? Can we not have some kind of uh, feeder vessel um, without? And can that be unmanned? Do we need, really need people on that vessel if it's just going to be going back and forward? We have a few going at one time. I know that the USA market with the Jones Act, we can't, there's going to need to be feeder vessels out there unless Biden changes um, so some of the legislation out there. But it's definitely something we're worth, worth thinking about. Um, identifying the downtime, I think for us to fully optimize the logistics, needs to be someone or, or a group of people that identify the downtime can share that information and then the companies that are developing these technologies can assess it and then see where the gaps are where where we can truly harness all the the power of these smart technologies um is it worth sending the parts um on um if you've got to send the human to do the job be sending someone to fixed or someone to um, do some kind of inspection will they not be taking the kit themselves and if they do forget the kit then is that is that when these things should be utilized or do we need to make a further step forward bring um, small robotics into it to, to take over the, the jobs that humans are doing um, so they, they can transport themselves to the site and they can do the job and then they can leave um, just down here as well, I'm just, just thinking, just to see if this engages anyone's kind of, of, of interest. Um, again, with the feeder vessels, do we, can we go one step um, thinking outside the box? There is people plugging monopiles and towing them to the site. Obviously, much smaller vessels will be able to tow, a little bit more risk with sealing a monopile, um, make sure it doesn't sink because then you've got a very big clean it's going to cost a lot of money but it's perhaps just another another thing to think about um and something else that that optimizing logistics can can help with the industry i'm just going to look at some of the port side operations now and how we can improve them and what that might look like um so first point i've got there's infrastructure improvements if if, if, if we're using a, a port, obviously the ports can be selected by the owner operator um, for, for the um, for the start of the campaign. Does that mean that the port's got to put more infrastructure in place? I'm thinking, do we need um, bigger cranes? Obviously, the, the turbines are getting larger, um, towers, blades, everything's getting bigger, it's getting larger. Do we need do we need to look at that? So we can have a more effective kind of port operation. Um, quick loadings for support vessels and feeder vessels. Is, is, is there some kind of way of optimizing a, a large system, something to to place, I don't know, pop parts onto the on the vessels before they go out? Is, is that can that all be automated as well? Do we really need to have a have a guy there or or, or a girl's clicking buttons to just to stack these um, part kits or, or whatever it might be on the vessels. I'm now thinking floating offshore wind. I know there's a lot of talk of why do we need to send a, a large vessel out there to try and assemble this very high tech, um, very large, very heavy turbine offshore. Can we not assemble them in the port? And then can we not tow them to the site? Um, if we're going to be doing that, again, it's going to be a lot of infrastructure needed in, in the ports that are chosen. Um, obviously, cranes, um, kind of slipways, all, all that kind of stuff. So is a way of, of bringing autonomy in, into that as well. And just the final point on this slide, um, the rapid response units for autonomous vessels and drones. If, if there is something going... If there is something that happens, 
I know I think Hamish mentioned before about the cost of, of fixing one cable, um, one cable failure can amount to millions. Do we need to have something standing by for these vehicles ready to go? Um, and who is going to be fixing that? Can that, can that be done? I think we're a bit far out for that to be done automatically. It's going to definitely take some kind of human intervention, but getting the parts, getting the kit, getting the people off there quickly is definitely going to be a benefit. Um, other ways of, of running vessel management, sorry, other smarter ways of running vessel management systems. I think that one of the biggest debates around the future of shipping is if, um, if, if what role, if any, will unmanned vessels will play. I think every, if, if we're joining this this um, webinar today, I think everyone's got a good idea or definitely got some kind of that that will be the case. Um, but do we need to take a, a step back? Is, is, is it all in the planning? I know that um, Siemens utilised a uh, bespoke 3D visualisation software tool to model their logistics with smart vessels. That actually started, um, that was developed by a UK company called Holder, and that started from the blades leaving the factory. And then that was um, mapping out any kind of low bridges, what's the best route to the port, um, identifying the, the sea states using a six or seven, eight years worth of, of, of data, uh, what's the best corridors to use, and all that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, so more more tools like this might be needed, uh, better, better developed tools, and then the, the unmanned vessels have definitely got the best best possible start. Um, I think data exchange is a big one as well. I think a lot of companies keep their they keep the data. Like uh, I don't think there's there's, there's much of a, of a share just in case the company has got the leg up. But I think data exchange is definitely something that we need to come together. We need to share the data. We need to know exactly what's going on and building up on, on each other's successes. Sanitization, people will be absolutely sick of hearing this, but if, if we can come up with one recognized um, system of, of doing this kind of works, it, it's, it's going to benefit the whole, um, the whole sector. And not only our sector, it's going to benefit any sector that, that's operating, let's see. Um, the vessels, again, when I was mentioning about the feeder vessels and the um, installation vessels, just as an example, can they use some kind of artificial intelligence to detect when they're next to each other for them to unload and, and leave and, and, and go into the next one, just to cancel out that, that kind of human error to speed up the process. Um, th these are all just things that I think that the industry would would want and, and needs and the catapult can be here to, to facilitate the, the programs to to look at funding bodies that we can maybe be putting in contact with to to develop to develop the projects um yeah but we're obviously here to help a lot of guys who are, are interested in these areas and it's pretty easy for us to put you onto the right person if you're not speaking to the right person at the start. Um, I've, I know I've flew through that, but I don't know if it's it's worth having a look at the results for the polls. <laughs> That's a looks like it's a no brainer there. Um, the yes, we mustn't have any any of the old old school boys here who don't want any change. That's that's really good to see. And the next one is, 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 is one I was interested in a little bit more. So quite a quite a fair split there. The one operator's coming up on top. Because so my internet connection is unstable the way, so I can leave the rest. OM contract installer 26. And then SMEs and government entities such as the catapult sharing the 17%. Um I don't know. I'd like to open that up to some of the other guys in the call. What do you, what do you think about that, Neil? Do you think that's a, did you expect that or? Yeah, again, all really positive stuff. I think that as Dan sort of picked up on there though, 
what is slightly different here when we talk about floating wind is it's very early days with the sector. So lots of our conversations at the moment about how we're, we're raising investment and altering port infrastructure. Um, lots of focus up in Scotland and down in the southwest. Um, now clearly because we're engaged in those development plans, the more we know about technical solutions um, to meet logistics issues, the better. Um, so again, just to anyone out there in the audience, do let us know what you're up to, have a chat with us if you've got interest in particular areas. Um, I'm certainly doing a lot of work with Falmouth uh, Harbour down in Cornwall at the moment. Um, has some capabilities, is missing others. Um, but again, those discussions are very interesting because we're talking about how we um, develop modular blades, for example, to open up that port and that infrastructure. Um, and again, understanding where the floating wind developments are going um, how they're going to be used and what some of the local supply chain benefits could be um, is really useful to understand at this stage. Um, and again, fingers crossed, we're going to have some money coming into the southwest to actually invest in the development of those facilities over the next couple of years. Um, but we really need to know what technologies you have, what the advances are um, and where we can sort of help facilitate your, your introduction into those projects and that understanding. And that'd be really, really useful. If I just use this forum just to, to drive some of my own initiatives, the um, the offshore test site that Matthew was um, telling us about before and some of the guys have touched on, um, me being part of the R&D team here, we're really pushing for projects that would benefit the site. So we, we've got this money to develop a site, but we really do need the projects to come in and um, and utilise the site, just, just help, help the region, helps the industry. So... The kind of ones we're looking at, we're looking at subsea charging stations. I know that Dan mentioned earlier about um, there's, there's some companies trying to drive for um, some sanitization on there, but we've we've been working with a company that want to um, develop their own. Obviously, we've got um, geotechnics, um, geotechnical companies wanting to come in and, and doing some cable barrel and and detection and all that kind of stuff and some outlet um, outlet site kind of um, communication work as well. So lots of different different projects going on there. It'd be really inter interesting to hear if anyone's got any other projects that might benefit from being tested at that site. Thanks. Yeah, this is, as I'm sure lots of you are aware, in order to drive those funding calls forward, um, we need to show evidence that the industry is obviously interested in that area, um, which is where we need your engagement to come through. Um, we're very capable of developing the bigs, pulling in the partners, um, but that new sort of technology innovation stuff you may have going on in the background, but that isn't public or we're not aware of, um, would be really, really helpful to understand. Um, so, amazingly, I shouldn't say that, but we um, seem to be bang on time. Um, so again, we, we will send out a email to everybody uh, that's participated after the event. Um, again, providing you a link to some of the uh, slides there. Um, do feel free to get in contact. Very happy to, to talk and share some of the opportunities we can help you um, deliver and potentially accelerate your technology development. Um, I'll leave it for there. So we're bang on time for 11.30. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks for all the catapult input there. Um, and hopefully I'll speak to some more of you in the future. Thank you.